It is April 28th, 2003. We're at the Peabody Public Library in Columbia City, Indiana. We are interviewing Bob Castle. My name is Janet Skank. I'm the director of the Peabody Public Library. Bob, what branch of service did you uh, serve? The Army. You were in the Army. And what war? World War II. And your uh, highest rank? Sergeant. And um, where did you serve? Europe. In Europe. Okay. Bob, were you drafted or did you enlist? I was drafted. Okay. Um, and where were you living at that time? Fort Wayne. In Fort Wayne. Um, when, um, this is a question I don't know, but did, when, when you're drafted, you don't get to pick the branch of the service. I did. Do you get to pick the branch of the I service? I did at that time. At that time, uh, they gave us a choice. They gave us a choice, and there's a little story goes with it. Go ahead. There was four of us, four of us buddies went in. I. I'm a dumb kid from Fort Wayne, what do I know? I picked the Army. Evidently it worked because I come back. Another one, his father was a Navy man, so he picked the Navy. Another one picked the Air Force. And the fourth guy said, I'm going in the Marines. And we said to him, don't go in the Marines, you're going to die, Marines get killed. I was in a lot of combat in World War II, all over Europe. Lost a lot of tanks, had them shot out from under me. The guy in the Navy was blown out of the water down in the Mediterranean Sea in a minesweeper. He survived. The guy in the Air Force was shot down as a prisoner of war in Germany. The guy we told was going to get killed in the Marines never left the States. He taught school. So that's the breaks. That's the breaks. Um, and what year was that? 42. I'm 42. Okay. Do you recall those first few days of boot camp and... Do I ever. <laughs> What was it like? Well, I'll tell you, I, uh, we, we, we were drafted, we went up to Camp Perry, and they put us on a train after the, uh, the initial uh, getting in the Army. They put us on a train and we went down to Camp Polk, Louisiana. And I spent time down there in my basic training. It wasn't boot camp, in the Army it's basic training. And uh, they found out I knew a lot about guns. So fortunately, I, I was able to go to school. And I eventually was teaching artillery. I, I was, uh, had the rank of armor artillery mechanic, and I taught gunnery and tank driving down there in, in uh, Louisiana until they formed the 8th Armored Division, but I went overseas with the 8th. And when was that? In 43. Uh, in 43. In 43. Okay. Um. You served in World War II. When you went over there, you said, where exactly did you go? We uh, got on a troop train down there in, in Louisiana, and I don't know where they resurrected that train, but it was the most horrible thing. Nothing worked. The lights didn't work. Air conditioning, they never heard of that. The toilets didn't even work. They finally got us up to uh, Camp Kilmer, New Jersey, and they formed the uh, convoy. And uh, they put us on the troop ship and shipped us out. There were guys puking over the rail before we got out, out of the sight of the Statue of Liberty. And the only thing I can say about a troop ship is it, the, the only thing I can compare, compare our troop ship to would be a slave ship coming over from Africa. They jammed as many of us in there as they could. 90% of them were sick. And some of the tales of the troop ship are, are not fit to put on tape. But it, it, was, uh, it was no pleasure cruise, took us, uh, I was in one of the biggest convoys of the war going over and uh, we, uh, it took us uh, uh, 18 days to get over. And uh, we landed in Southampton, England and picked up our equipment, got the tanks ready, loaded the ammunition and stuff. Then we were shipped from uh, Portsmouth over to uh, Europe on an LST. And where, where in Europe then did you? We stopped, we, we landed in Le Havre. Which is in France? Right, in France. In France. And fortunately, I got in after D-Day, so I, I got into Europe with dry feet. Oh, okay. Um, okay, so we've got, you're over in Europe now. Do you want to just go on with that then and uh, explain some of your experiences? I, uh, like I said before, I was, in the, I was a tanker and uh, the company commander uh, wanted me to take a tank, and I said, I'll, I'll be glad to, but I, 
I, I don't want to be tank commander. I don't want to be tank commander. I want to be gunner because that's my job. I mean, hey, I, I was good shot. I'm here. And uh, so they let me pick my crew. And uh, I got a guy who worked in the railroad from uh, New York, was my tank commander. Uh, he stuck his head out of the turret. I ain't sticking my head out of the turret. But I was a gunner, and I was a good shot. I, it, it, uh, it, uh, I was, did a lot of uh, demonstration work here in the States uh, with the big artillery. And uh, I handled everything from the pistol all the way up to the 155 millimeter cannon, which was the biggest thing we had, the big howitzer. Uh, we fought up in through France, Luxembourg, Holland, Belgium, all over northern Germany, I was in the Battle of the Bulge. Mm -hmm. The Battle of the Bulge is beyond belief. The, uh, I was never so cold in my life. I was never so cold in my life. It was knee deep in snow, no way to get warm. There you're sitting at 40 tons of ice cold iron. And uh, it, it, uh, it, was, it was absolutely, well, Everything was in confusion in the Battle of the Bulge. Nobody knew where anything was. And uh, the Germans had infiltrated our lines. And uh, we, we, I had everything I owned on. Where, where was the, did the Battle of the Bulge take place? In Belgium. In Belgium. In, in the Ardennes Forest. Okay. It's right, right on the line between Belgium and, and, and Germany. It's, it's, a, it's a, a deep forest. The, the lines were very thin there, and the Germans attacked through there, and they didn't think they could come through there, but they did. And uh, it, uh, it was, uh, it, 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 go ahead. Well, just a just question, you know, you remember you're talking to someone who did not live through it and doesn't know that much about it. Um, when you say you, you were on the tank, you were on that tank. I mean, you just didn't go to a tent and sleep, or that, your home was that tank? Oh, yeah. Okay. I mean, it, it, the, uh, that, 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 that was it. That was my home base. And uh, we had 18 tanks in the company. 18 tanks in the, in the, in the company and uh, three platoons. I was in the second platoon. I had the second tank in the second platoon. And uh, uh, we, had, we, we were in some terrific battles. Uh, and were there casualties? Terrible. Terrible casualties. I've, 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 I've lost, well, just an example. In one battle, we went in in the morning with 118, 120 men and 18 tanks. And by afternoon, there was tw there was 18 of us left and three tanks. Mm. I lost mine right away. I crawled back. I crawled back in the ditch. And uh, the next morning, well, that night, the ones that were left, uh, of, uh, the ones of us that survived that, most of them were in so shock. I guess I wasn't smart enough to go into shock because I never did. But uh, the next morning, they uh, brought up the grave registration. And what to, is that? To pick up the bodies. Okay. And I knew those guys would screw things up. So I went up, I went up with them. The rest of the guys were in pretty bad shape then. The company commander was completely out of his head. We were down in the cellar. We were down in the cellar in this house. and. Uh, uh, the guys were sitting around on the floor. Most of them were just out of it. I mean, glazed, starry-eyed. The company commander was over in the corner, just babbling. Blah, blah, blah. He was. So I went up with the grave registration, and uh, the first tank we came to, uh, see this battle. When we went up, the Germans had set up two 88s. Now, an 88 is an anti, a German anti-aircraft gun that they found out if they depressed the anti-aircraft gun, they could kill tanks with it. So there's one on each side of the road. Now this road was mined on both sides. They had 288 setting up on, and these uh, anti-aircraft, multiple anti-aircraft, I, I guess they were 20 millimeters. German uh, were two on each side of the uh, 88s. The 88s knocked out the first tank and the last tank and then picked them off one by one. And uh, the first tank I came to, I, I said to the grave registration, that's Sergeant West laying over there, and there's part of him over here, and there's part of him over there. So we got him picked up. They, they, they would come up with mattress covers. 
and they would pick these bodies up and put them in mattress covers and label them and send them back for burial. And the next tank I came to was a buddy of mine and uh, I, I, I looked up on the turret and there was one of these grave registration guys who were standing up on the turret looking down in and the turret hatch was open and uh, he said, I ain't going down in there. And I said, uh, well, what's the matter? He said, I ain't going down in there. So I went up, I crawled up on the turret and I looked down in and there's, uh, there's uh, uh, another one of my buddies down there and he'd been shot in half. And he was all over the inside of the tank. So I crawled down in there and I took one of his legs and put it out through the turret, then the other leg. And when I kept picking up his torso, his liver kept falling out on the deck of the tank. So I said, give me a mattress cover. I finally got, got him tucked in and we got him together outside. And uh, this, is, this is combat. And uh, I went up a little bit further and there lays uh, Sergeant Gozeman, great big cowboy from, from the out west. And uh, we called him Bronk. My God, he was a big guy. Laying there stone dead. There ain't a mark on him, not a drop of blood. I have no idea how he got killed. Probably concussion. Went up a little bit further, and uh, I was, this tank was knocked out right ahead of us. Oh, I mean, it was shot by the Germans. An 88 was setting up down the end of the street, and it, uh, one round went into that tank. And we started to back off, trying to get back of a building so that 88 wouldn't catch us. And the 88 hit that tank again, and uh, Sergeant Beck come out of the turret, with his left leg blown off below the knee. And he fell down on the ground. The last I saw him, he was on the ground wrapping his field jacket around the stump of his leg to keep from bleeding to death. Well, as it turned out, Beck was captured by the Germans. And then the Germans had captured Beck, got captured by the Americans, so Beck survived. And I was at several uh, uh, meetings with him, and uh, he died year four last. But. Uh, it, uh, uh, this is an idea of, of what really combat is. This, this is nothing like Hollywood puts out. I mean, it, it was a, uh, I, I went up the next morning when I was up there, I went up to this tank and it had been hit a third time. And I knew my buddy that was the driver was killed. And uh, that's the only time during the whole war I almost lost it. I uh, opened the, uh, hatch, the driver's hatch, and he sat in there, the tank had burnt after the third time it had been hit, and he was completely burnt from here up. All the flesh was burnt off in his uh, upper body. It was, that, I almost lost it that day. And after that battle, you said, that, you said 18 people survived, is that what you yeah, said? Yeah. 18 people survived that? When you, when you suffer casualties like that, what happens? I mean, the war wasn't over. So, I mean, how do you, do you regroup or what do you do? They pulled us back, they pulled us back into Fenlo, Holland. They pulled us back into Fenlo, Holland and they, of course, gave us new tanks. And we were in there for several days getting the tanks ready. They brought us up a bunch of replacements. Some of them have never seen a tank before. And uh, we were, we uh, went up to the, the edge of the river and uh, Vladrop, Germany was right across the river. And we dug a, a tank in uh, on the bank of this river and uh, shooting over into Vladrop, Germany. We, we would take these kids up, these new recruits up, and put them in a tank and fire a few rounds so they know what, what uh, it felt like when the gun went off. It was a, that's a sensation. The, gun, the big gun goes off <coughs> and uh, it's a big artillery piece, and at that time I, I, we had 76s on the tank. Eventually we, we started out with 75s, and we ended up with the 90s, but 76s at that time. And when the gun goes off, the uh, big artillery piece should re recoil four feet. But it's, it's snubbed down so it's, it, uh, it will fit in the turret of the tank, and it only re recoils 18 inches. And when it recoils 18 inches, the, the uh, gas is not really all out of the barrel yet, so you get a puff of gas out, plus the brass on the back of the shell comes boiling out of the back of that gun and falls down on the deck of the tank with a big clang, 
So it, it, it's, it's quite a sensation when that gun goes off. Okay. Um, and then from Holland, where did you go? Well, we, uh, there, were, there were several, and we were in quite a bit of combat. At the, uh, we were in quite a bit of combat. Uh, we were in the Wessel Pocket, and uh, the sensation of going across the Rhine River. I was up at the edge of the Rhine River, and we watched the paratroopers come in and to establish the bridgehead on the other side of the river. And they came in on gliders. And I'm telling you, I, I, I feel that more people were killed, more soldiers were killed in those gliders than the Germans did. Because those gliders, you know, you can't, you can't stir them once you get them down. You can't stop them, they're on skids. And I, this is, I, I remember this one glider landed on an orchard and tore off both wings, and then it slid sideways and broke in half, and those guys just flew out. But they finally did get the bridgeheads established, and I went across the Rhine River on a pontoon bridge. Now Is that, that one that the Army would have built? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Army put this pontoon bridge under fire. They put this pontoon bridge in, and there I, we are out in the middle of the Rhine River under fire, and as you go across this thing, these boats are set side by side with tracks on top. And there I am sitting up there in a 40 tons of steel. And every time you got to one of these boats, it would sink down, almost down into the water. And you're watching all this fire come in and you're thinking, what would happen if, the, if this bridge gave out? And I know what would happen. That tank would sunk like a stone. So, <laughs> So that gives you, but we didn't make it across. Then. Okay, so you went across the Rhine. Yeah. That and means you're in Germany now, we were right? in, We were all over in Germany. Okay. I mean, we were, we were all over northern Germany. Back and forth, we fought up in the, in the uh, Hartz Mountains. We fought all over northern Germany. Uh, but I, I, I want to tell you about, about uh, the concentration camps. That, that, that's something I want to be sure to tell you. Uh, we liberated uh, a concentration camp uh, Langenstein Zeigerkelager. Also, I got I got into Buchenwald, which was a very notorious camp. Now, you can, we we liberated a lot of prisoner of wars uh, camps too, but these these concentration camps were they were the death camps, and. I can't, I can't describe the horror, how, how people, one human can treat another one that bad. Uh, we got in there and those people, the ones that were still alive, were just zombies. I mean, 90% of them were out of their mind. They were just skin and, and skeletons with skin stretched across them. We tried to give them food. They couldn't retain it because, so they, uh, the, uh, Bodies were piled up in, in stacks, hundreds. Hundreds of bodies were piled up because the Germans didn't have time to burn them yet. And uh, that, uh, I, got, I got to talking to uh, uh, one of the inmates there. He was a, 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 a Jewish doctor. And he was, he was uh, in pretty, pretty fair condition. The only thing is he had lost so much weight that his teeth kept were, were so loose, his false teeth were so loose that he'd talk and his uppers would come down and fall on his lowers and broken German English and dropped teeth. We, we, we had an awful time with but he told me a lot about that went on in the camp. And it was it was absolutely I can I, I tell the kids when I go around to school. I can tell you how the camp was set up. I can tell you how the people who looked who were dead. I can tell you how the people who looked were alive. But I can't tell you the smell. Once you smell a concentration camp, you'll never forget it. Hundreds of bodies in various stages of decomposition, and even the people that were alive smelled like death. It, it was, it, I, I like I say, I, I, I don't know how humans could treat each other that way. How many? You said you you liberated a few of them. That you mentioned the two. Yeah. Uh, how many were you really? How many were you involved with? That I mean, that were the main ones that I was involved ones. in. We liberated a lot of 
prisoner of war camps. Prisoner of war camps. Now that that's a, that's another different thing. That's that's uh, uh, prisoners, Dr uh, British and, and uh, Polish uh, mm -hmm. uh, Americans soldiers. But these these concentration camps were they were horrible, absolutely horrible. Well, you said you tried to give them food. Yes. Um, I mean, you guys. I mean, you did as much as you can for them. But what happened after you left? I mean, they they brought in they brought in a military government from the rear, medic medication and so forth, and a lot of those people just wandered off. Just wandered off. They were out in the countryside, just just wandering around. It was it was absolutely it, it was I I was pretty pretty uh, toughened up by that time. But I mean, it was it was heartrending. I mean, uh, the uh, you saw these people just in a, in a daze wandering around out in the fields. It's then, um, how long did you have to, did you stay there then? In we Germany? were we were only in a short time. See, we were still in combat, okay. and we were combat troops. And once we once we went in, the the SS uh, took off, and we secured the camp. And then they finally relieved us. They relieved us with infantry and this, these rear echelon people, and we went on to fight. But uh, the uh, the concentration camps were run by uh, the Waffen SS. And, uh, it, and about what, when was this then? It, the war was pretty well over. Pretty I mean, yeah, coming yeah, to yeah, a yeah, close we were, then. We were well into Germany. Okay. okay. Anything else about? Um serving there? Well, let's see. What, 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 let's, let's look at the notes here and see what I... Uh, yeah, the, uh, like I talked about, the SS. The SS were, uh, they were a bunch of fanatics. And, uh, they were not regular army, right? Pardon? They were not regular army? The Actually, they were, they were German army, but they were, they were, uh, they, when they swore allegiance, they didn't swear allegiance to the, to the fatherland, to Germany. They swore allegiance to Adolf Hitler. Wow. Uh, when we captured, when we captured uh, the regular army, the the, uh, the Volkstrom, or the the Wehrmacht, when we captured the Wehrmacht, we didn't really worry too much about them. They were tickled to death the war was over. They were a bunch of GIs that were in the army because they had to be like us. But when you captured an SS, you didn't turn your back. If you if you captured an SS man, he he was a fanatic. You just absolutely didn't trust him at all. Uh, and how could you tell? Uh, how could you tell the difference? Did they come up and different tell you? uniform? Different uniform. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And the worst, the worst of the SS were called the Totkopf. And if you ever see TV uh, or newsreel, take a look at their their uh, insignia on their hat. It's a, a, de a silver skull with crossbones. That's the death head SS. They're the, they're the worst of the worst. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the SS had. Two lightning bolts on their their uh, ep, uh, their lapel. Okay, didn't know that. Yeah, the uh, one time I captured, I we captured a bunch of prisoners, and uh, uh, it, it it was in this big battle that I was telling about, and uh, this uh, fellow and I decided we would we would take them back to the rear, because they said. There's a pre prisoner of war camp. The MPs have set up a prisoner of war camp down the just down the road. So we had 26 guys. Part of them were from North Africa, the uh, the uh, Africa Corps. They were tough cookies, and uh, we we marched these guys down the road. And it was late in the afternoon, and uh, we figured the PW camp was just down the road. We went on and on and on. No PW, no nothing. And uh, it started to get dark. And I said to Freeman, I said, I understand enough German. I said, those guys have figured on jumping us as soon as it gets dark enough. <laughs> Freeman said, what are we going to do? I said, we're going to kill them. We're going to have to. So we were standing there discussing which ones we were going to shoot first. And uh, we heard a bunch of motors. And I said to Freeman, let's not do it now. It, those may be the Germans. Fortunately, it was, it was a, a uh, regiment of American infantry coming up to relieve our company. And I went to the colonel and I said, Colonel, I've never been so glad to see anybody in my life. Would you like some prisoners? Sure, he said, we'll take them off your hands.
And then what did he do with them? I mean, oh, he take them back. He, he, he was able to. Yeah, he, he had enough men. He, he had enough. He had, men a, to do he had that. a whole regiment. Yeah. There were just two he of us. Two to twenty-six. Hmm. Yeah, they. Uh, I was a lot of a lot of uh, real bad combat. I mean, when one of these tanks got hit, one of these tanks we called them flaming coffins. We told that's what you, the, the ones you were driving. Yes. Okay. See, the the Russians really had a good tank. The Germans had the best tanks. I mean, those German tanks, uh, they were they were terrific, and the British had the next best. Then we had the clunkers. I mean, they they, they the the uh, M4s had a a lot of uh, the Shermans had a lot of advantages. We had a uh, stabilized gun that. On the hydraulics, the tank would go like this, and the gun would stay steady. And we had a, a, a power turret that you, it was uh, on, a, on a motor. And there was a lot of advantages. We could, we could shoot running that the Germans couldn't. <coughs> so it was, we had a lot of advantages over the Germans in some ways, but man, those, those 88 millimeter cannons they had, when we were in England, they had captured an 88, and they brought it over to England. And when we were getting our stuff ready, they took us in, in to show us a bunch of uh, German arms. And uh, the British uh, officer said, "Now, mates," he said, "you don't have to worry about the 88." He said, "No, no, no sweat." He said, "Don't worry about the 88." He was right, because the 88 hit the tank, and your worries were over. So he didn't lie. Didn't, they didn't offer much protection. No, the uh, the 88 would penetrate that. That our armor just did, just and our our poor old little 75s when we were shooting that it would you'd watch the the shell go out tracer on the back of the shell you watch the shell go out hit the German tank and just bounce right off it just we could how did you destroy a tank then how, how, was, how lucky, was a tank destroyed if you look if you're lucky you'd hit them in the track or if you got a good shot you could hit them in the rear and you might you might knock out a German tank but a front front frontal you might as well throw wet peas at them. Okay, um, let's talk a little bit about social life in the Army then, Bob. Were you married during the war? No. Okay. Um, but did you did you have family back in Fort Wayne then? Oh, yeah, I had How, how did you keep in touch with them? Uh, V-mail. V-mail. Explain what that is. You write, you, write, you write the letter, and the officers censor it, and take out about 90% of, of what you wrote, and then they, they microfilm the thing. And they sent back the microfilm, and then they blew it back up and mailed it home. Let me see if I understand this right. You would write a letter, somebody would censor it and take yeah. a microfilm picture of it. Yeah. Send that, and then somebody at home would print that out. Right. And they would send, they would send the family. real microfilm home, and print out the the. They were little little letters about this big, when they were printed out. I'll be. But it was all right because at least we used to get mail occasionally. How often? Whenever they could find us. Whenever they could find you. Because we were, we were up in the, we were up on the front lines continually. I was, I was never so filthy in my life. Uh, what, what kind of supplies did you have? Food and, and uh... Let me tell you about filthy first. Okay. I never had my clothes off from November to March. The only place that was clean on me is where my eyes ran and my wiped my nose. The rest of us was ju were just dirty. The rear echelon, the guys in the rear, would come up and they would see us with rags around our neck. They thought, hey, that's the thing. The guys in combat are wearing scarves. So they started wearing scarves in the back end. What they didn't know is we went in these houses and picked up rags and put them down in our collars because our wool shirts were so filthy dirty that our necks were breaking out. It's interesting. Yeah, there, there's, you, didn't, you didn't take too many showers. The first shower I had was in Metz, Germany. It was in March, and uh, my God, I we, we went in there. They had three tents. One tent you took your clothes off. You kept your pistol belt, your and your boots, and your weapon, and you threw everything else on on the pile. And you went in there and you took a shower, and you went into the next tent. And there's a mountain of clothes. All of the guys that had showered before you had they had laundered the clothes and there were socks in there about that long. <laughs> but did you didn't get your own clothes back then? Oh no. Oh no. Okay. And so we sorted through the clothes until you found something that fit. 
and you, you kept sorting until you got, man, I, it was cold. And I, I, I went out there with, with several pairs of pants on, and, but, but, oh God, it was cold. Well, how, what did they, what did they give you? I mean, what kind of supplies did they, did you have to carry, or? Well, in, yeah. in the tank, we were fortunate in the tank. We, we were able to, to stash uh, food and stuff, uh, but the food was, was we, we were in bad shape. It was, uh, the uh, sea rations. Sea rations? Oh, God. They were horrible. Uh, sea rations, at that time, you had three kinds of sea rations. The little cans. One was the uh, hash. One was meat and vegetable stew. And one was meat and beans. Now, the meat and beans wasn't too bad. I mean, you could eat that cold and get away with it. Now, the meat and vegetable stew, if you could heat it, it was edible, just barely. But it was diced up vegetables and, and uh, God knows what kind of meat. But the hash was the thing, no matter what you did to the hash, it was inedible. I mean, it, it was just diced up potatoes in grease. And no matter what you did to it, you couldn't eat it. But the, uh, the sea rations, when we had a chance, we would, we would set them on the manifold of the motor. And then you had a choice when you opened the can. You had ice cold, pretty warm, and burnt. <laughs> Did you ever get to um, Wong? Uh, it sounds like you were there in the winter, so there couldn't have been too many fruits and vegetables available. Oh, no, that's nothing. all you had to survive on? Apples. Apples. They had, they had a lot of apples. They had a lot of apples, and they were dried up. They looked like prunes. But hey, they, were, they, was, be they was better than our rations. Um, were you in combat the whole time? You were there, yeah. or there, 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 yeah. there weren't any downtime? Well, yeah, there was downtime. I mean, you had, you had to gas the tank. You had to gas the tank, you had to put ammunition in it. I meant for any prolonged period of time. Oh, no. No. no the so only time we were, we were back is, is after, after Rheinberg when, we, when we, they pulled us back to Fenlo to, to give us new tanks. That's the only time we were out of And that combat. wasn't for a very long period no, of time, no, was it? No. And uh, uh, <coughs> talk about cold. Uh, I just I just remembered something. Frostbite. Frostbite was especially in the tank sitting there in the, in the uh, at least the infantry could, could walk and get some circulation going. And I'm telling you, my feet were numb up to my knees. I mean, it. They finally all we had was just leather shoes, regular uh, combat boots. Uh, you know the old boot with the with the strap. Mm -hmm. Anyway, we. They finally, uh, I, they said they, they flew them over in an aircraft, I don't know. But they finally issued us some rubber overshoes, four buckle overshoes. And we took our, we couldn't take your shoes off. I never, I never took my shoes off, you couldn't. If you took your shoes off, even if you put them down in your, in your blankets, they'd freeze at night and you couldn't get them back on. So. I finally took my shoes off, the rest of us did too. We took our shoes off, we didn't have to do a lot of walking in the tank. And we wrapped our feet in captured wool German blankets and put them down in the, in the rubber overshoes without any boots on, without any leather shoes on, like shoe packs. And that's the only reason I got toes today. Um, let's talk a little bit about the end of, uh, the end of your service. Um, do you remember the day it ended, your service? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, where were you? And well, I... Uh, or how did you get to back from Germany? Huh? How did you get back from Germany? Well, I'll tell first? you that. I was over in, uh, in Czechoslovakia. They, uh, they took us down, they shipped the whole, the whole division down to Czechoslovakia to guard a division of Germans that had surrendered down there. And... Uh, we set up a perimeter, and, and uh, they were processing these German prisoners of war. And we were stationed in a little town called Buschweiss. It was right outside of uh, Pilsen. Are you here of Pilsener beer? Mm -hmm. Okay, this is where it came from. And every, every morning we would send a six by six truck with barrels, not kegs, barrels, into the brewery to get our day's supply. And this, the war was over. We were we were having a ball, and they may have had water in that town of Bush of Ice, but I don't know. 
I never had the occasion to use any. <laughs> we all had our own pitcher. And uh, the, the, we had a time, but uh, the, uh, they, we finally turned the tanks in. And the, uh, we had 18 tanks at that time, 100 gallons of gas apiece. And the guys had siphoned enough gas out and swapped it to the Russians for vodka that they had to bring up truckloads of gas to put in the tanks so we could drive them to Nuremberg. But when the war was over, you asked me about the war being over. Yeah, I can remember that. And uh, uh, finally, I got a notice from uh, home that my dad was was uh, uh, terminally ill. So I uh, applied for a, uh, went to the company commander. He said, yeah, we'll take care of you. You're going home. I had enough points to get out, see, so I, it, 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 there's no problem. Can you explain to me about points, what that meant? Yeah, for every, every, uh, the term of service you had, for every medal you had, and so forth, you had so many points. And if you accumulated yay many points, you were eligible to go home. Really? So I had enough points to go home. So once I got back here to the States, I was, I was ready to dis get discharged. But I, I got to fly home. 18 days over and 18 hours home. So I, uh, I was very fortunate in that. But I did get home in time to see my dad before he died. So that you you were able to leave them before the actual end declaration of the end of oh, the war? Oh no, the war was over. The war was already the war, over. Yeah, the war was over, over. That time. Yeah. Uh, in fact, even the war in Japan was over by that time. What, what did you do then after the war? I mean, they kept you there after the war was over. What kind of things did you do? Guard these prisoners. Guard the prisoners? Yeah. That thing. They still have prisoners then after the war? Pardon? They still have prisoners after the war? They still had prisoners. Oh, after? sure. Until they processed all those Germans, they uh, they kept them as prisoner of war. Okay. Yeah, they uh, they had to sort out the Nazis and, and they. Mm. Yeah, that. Uh, like they, but they they would have had to find see if there's anybody there they had to try or something like that to see if there's anybody they had to try or right, do right, a right, type of right. thing. Yeah, I uh, I had uh, I had contact with uh, uh, some of the people who were. In the Nuremberg trial, oh, really? in fact, yeah, we captured one of the one of the participants, and, and uh, he uh, claimed to be a non-Nazi. A non-Nazi. Until we talked to one of his, he was he was in charge of the all of the slave labor up in the Hartz Mountains. And one of the Russian prisoners that he had clued us in where he had his, his loot buried, and we went out and dug it up cases. Big, Greek, oh, these cases were as big as this table here. Uh, uh, all uh, metal-bound cases, all of these pictures, shaking hands with good old Adolf and the whole bit, and uh, we we uh, we had him we had him dead to right. Okay. After you got back in the states, then um, did, what did you do? I came home, okay. and uh, saw my dad was pretty pretty good. I mean, he would last a, f a few more days or weeks, and I said to my mother, I'm going down to get my discharge. So I went down to Camp Campbell, Kentucky, and uh, I went down, and of course I was still in uniform, I wasn't out yet, and there I am in the old wool uniform from Europe. Everybody else is, is, is uh, it's August, you know, everybody else is in khakis, you know, here in the States, and they look at me, and uh, I went into, uh, I went into this, uh, separation center and lo and behold the guys that were processing these uh, soldiers to be discharged were guys from my outfit uh, from overseas that were on the way to Japan and got sidetracked at Campbell. So I came home with all kinds of uniforms. They said don't go home, don't go home, stay here. We'll have you out in, in, day after tomorrow, we'll have you discharged. So I got my discharge day after tomorrow. And were you able, when, when you finally got out, were you able to use the, like, the GI Bill or anything like that? Oh, yeah. yeah I, I used the GI use Bill that? when I uh, studied to be a tool die maker. And I, I, it, 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 it really had, it was an advantage. I, it was good. And is that what you did then? Yes, I was a tool or, die maker, uh, international harvester, uh, 32 and 3 tenths years. 32 and 3 tenths. Yeah. Got, this, got, got uh, retired from the harvester and I've enjoyed it ever since. In fact, if I live two or three more years, I'll, I'll have been retired as long as I worked. 
pretty good. Yeah, I retired when I was 50. Congratulations. Um, did you join any of the veterans organizations? Oh, yeah. Which ones do you belong to? Legion. The Legion? 40 and 8. Okay. And what kind of things do you do with the Legion? Well, I was a color guard, firing squad. I buried, I buried uh, God knows how many uh, repatriated bodies. Uh, but the harvester was good. I mean, they, they would let me uh, go on these uh, funeral details and they would pay me. And mm -hmm. it was, it was, uh, it was, it was, a, the harvester was a good place to work. Good. Bob, is there anything else you'd like to add to the interview? Well, how much time we got here? Oh, we have a little bit of time. Well, let's see. What, what haven't I, let me, let me check the, uh, I'll tell you about one, 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 uh, one little batch of combat I was in. There was a, a, uh, a kind of an unusual situation. It was a house. It set out. Usually the, the houses over there were in villages. And this house set out in the fields. And there was a house set here and a barn set here. And this road went down past the house and made a curve down about a quarter of a mile. And the infantry had went up and they had captured the house. And the SS had pinned them down in this house because they were in this barn. And behind this stone wall, there was a stone wall ran outside the, uh, the farmyard right next to the road. And uh, the infantry radioed back, <coughs> we're running out of ammunition. Well, that was one of my days I wasn't too smart. I said, we'll, we'll bring you up some. So they, they had a, a, a field piece, the Germans, shooting down this road. So I had Lee, my driver, drive down in the ditch. He drove down in the ditch. So he, we, they, this field piece couldn't, couldn't hit us on the road. And we pulled up next to this house, uh, next to this stone wall, and we bopped around the corner back of the barn and the field piece could traverse fast. I mean, he couldn't. And uh, he shot at me twice and missed both times, fortunately. And uh, fortunately, I got him on the first shot. And uh, uh, we backed in around the barn, and I pulled up next to the stone wall, and I threw a, a uh, artillery shell into the barn, and that took care of the SS. And uh, I noticed that they, we had the turret open at the time. And I noticed that I, I was down in the gunner seat. And I noticed out of my periscope this wall, there was a German helmet kept bopping up like this. And I thought to myself, uh oh. So these guys in the house, I don't know why they didn't shoot him. They had a clear shot at him. And uh, the next time he came up, I took my 30 caliber machine gun and Raked the top of this wall, took Toffee's head off right there. That, 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 that. This that is war. Huh? That was war. Yeah, it, 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 you don't get this stuff in Hollywood, and uh, or in the books. Un, un, unfortunately, unfortunately, the books that they teach in school now are politically politically correct. They're whitewashed out. These kids, when I when I go into the schools and give uh, some of my uh, lectures. They come up and thank me and say, we had no idea this is how it was. So that, uh, that's just, uh, unless I can, I can. Uh, We've got some time. If you got more, we have time. Oh, I got gobs. Go ahead. Well, let's see what we got here. Uh, this. Uh, this man that was uh, was uh, I, uh, that had the leg shot off, uh, he, he they had the tank right ahead of us. Now the lieutenant in that tank was a great big uh, a guy named Erickson. He was a great big Swede from up Wisconsin. I mean big. And uh, when the when the war was over, the story came out in our history that Erickson got down off the tank and attacked the Germans on foot. And Beck, who had his leg shot off, said, that's not right. That's not right. I watched him get killed. 
He said, I watched the sniper shot him, and he shot Erickson right here below his nose and blew the back of his head out. And he said, Erickson had his pistol out and shot three times in the ground and fell down in the tank. And he says, then, of course, he said, I had my leg shot off, and I got out. But he said, when that tank burnt, Erickson burnt that tank. Mm. So he bur evidently burnt up completely because they never found his body. Okay. So that, okay. yeah, that, oh, I could go on for days. But the, the, uh, the German 88s, I talked about that, the Panzerfausts, Panzerfausts. That, uh, you know, a Panzer is the German tank. And Faust, of course, sold his soul to the devil. So they named this this bazooka, the German bazooka, the Panzerfaust. Blow your tank all to hell. And it was, it, it our, ours, ours was a tube that you put a rocket in. Theirs was a, a tube with a great big explosion, uh, explosive on the end. It looked like a toilet plunger, but it worked. It worked real good. But that's Panzerfaust. Then they had the uh, the Schmeiser machine pistol. That was their their uh, handheld machine gun. That was a very effective weapon. Now that wasn't on the tank. That would be something you held. No, no that was a personal weapon. Personal weapon. Yeah, I uh, I carried a usually I carried a, uh, a carbine, and uh, the other guys carried what they called the grease gun. That was our our uh, personal machine gun, and uh, of course I carried a forty-five. Uh, uh, government issue pistol in my in a in a uh, shoulder holster, and I did that because uh, when I had it hanging on my pistol belt, every time I got in and out of the tank, it would hang up on the turret. So I put it <coughs> I put it in a, in a, a, a shoulder holster, holster, and I knew enough German that I would let. <laughs> we had a bunch of Germans captured there and there, standing there like this, and I the one nudged the other one like this. He says, "Look." Look at the gun with the look at the one with the gun in his coat. He must be a Chicago gangster. <laughs> <laughs> they knew about Chicago. That, that question then, um, you talked about the prisoners of war in the German army and the SS. How about the, just the uh, plain old population that lived there? What kind of reception did you get from them? Cold. Cold, really? Yes. I mean, they were. Ab I never had any real contact with German civilians. As civilians, they were they were uh, we were in, in combat at the time, and most of them were hiding down the cellar. Most of them were hiding down in their their cellars down there are domed. I mean, they're they're they're, they're most of them are uh, Los houses are made out of uh, brick and stone, you know, and most of them have a domed cellar in them, and like a it, it really makes a good bomb shelter, and most of them were hiding down the cellar. So, you so I really not ha did not have a lot of them. contact with a German civilian. Okay. And when the war was over, they transferred us down into Czechoslovakia. Well, that was an experience. That, boy, they were primitive down there. Really? Oh, gosh. Of course, that's a lot of years ago, but um, there was only one, one vehicle in the whole town, little tiny town. It was the bakery truck, and it ran on wood. They would cube up pine and put it in this tank and it would smolder and produce gas, and they would wash this gas, and they would run their motor on it. It's primitive, isn't it? But most of them were uh, were uh, horse-drawn vehicles. Okay, well, I I probably have kept you long enough. No, we. Um, it's all very interesting, all very important. We want to thank you for participating. Um, we will uh, keep a copy here at the library, and we're going to be sending the other one in then.